Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about dynamical systems theory. Um, so dynamical systems theory has a lot of other names. It's also called dynamic pattern theory, coordination dynamics theory, ecological theory, and action theory. Um, so dynamical systems theory is a multidisciplinary perspective that is based on physics, biology, chemistry, and mathematics. Uh, and this type of theory is applied in lots of different areas of science, not only in motor control. Uh, human movement control is a complex system that behaves similarly to any complex biological or physical system. Uh, so we can <clears throat> make a lot of comparisons between human movement control and a lot of other physical phenomenon uh, that help us understand how things work in motor control. Um, so human motor control is seen from the perspective of nonlinear dynamics. Um, so nonlinear behavior um, occurs when, uh, an example is when uh, the temperature of water gradually rises and suddenly boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So we go from a state of not boiling, the water is just on the stove and it's not boiling yet, but the temperature is gradually increasing. And then suddenly we cross a threshold in temperature and it abruptly changes in behavior from a state of not boiling to a state of boiling. And that's an example of nonlinear behavior where we have a sudden abrupt change. So behavior changes over time to not follow a continuous linear progression, but instead there's a sudden abrupt change, like changing from not boiling to boiling. Um, so when we apply that concept in movement behavior, um, a systematic change in one variable can cause a nonlinear behavioral change in human coordinated movement. Um, so if we take our example of boiling water, of course that's not human coordinated movement, um, but if we take our example there, then the one variable that's changing is the temperature of the water. So that changing temperature of the water is the systematic change in a variable. And then that causes nonlinear behavioral change in the water. Um, it's not linear in the sense that we're not just gradually boiling a little more and a little more, but instead the, the temperature is increasing but then suddenly there's an abrupt change to a state of boiling. And that's what we mean there. Um, so distinct coordination patterns can spontaneously develop as a function of a change in a specific variable. And a common one that we use here is speed. Um, so here are a few examples in movement behavior. Um, so out of sync fingers that are moving will spontaneously synchronize after a certain threshold of speed is passed. So there's studies where there's movement of fingers and they're out of sync, but then once we pass a certain threshold in speed, uh, then they synchronize spontaneously. Um, another example of spontaneous changes to arm coordination patterns during swimming. So in front crawl strokes in swimming, um, there, there can be less synchronization or a change in synchronization that occurs when um, a certain speed threshold is reached. And then finally, this is one we've all experienced directly, uh, there's a spontaneous change from walking to running gait when we reach a certain speed. So we walk comfortably at a certain speed and as we increase in speed, there's a natural change that occurs. There's a transition from one phase to another between a walking gait and a running gait. Okay, so stability. So stability, we define it in so many different ways depending on what area of science we're looking at and even what context within the same science. Um, in dynamics, stability is the behavioral steady state of a system. Um, it also incorporates the notion of variability by noting that when a system is slightly perturbed, it will return spontaneously to a stable state. Um, so like if we have a bowl and there's a ball in the bowl and nothing is touching it, it's stable, it's not moving. If we tap the ball, it might cause it to roll around a little bit and it will return right back to its original position and its original steady state. Um, so we would say that that, state, that, um, that system is stable um, because even when it's perturbed, slightly perturbed, like we tap on the ball and it's disturbed and moves around a little bit, that it's still going to spontaneously return back to its stable state. 
Um, so observing characteristics of a stable state helps us understand the variables that influence a system to behave the way it does. So if we observe characteristics of a stable state, like when we're heating water, um, it helps us to understand the stable state that occurs before and after we reach boiling point so that we can understand how the variable, in that case, the heat that we're applying to the water affects the system. Um, so like when we're heating water, it's a stable state when the temperature is increasing and the water's not boiling yet. And it's a stable state when the water is at a full boil and we're in an instable state when we're in that transition in between. That's the phase transition where we're transitioning from the first stable state to the second stable state. Attractors are also referred to as attractor states, and that's the stable behavioral state, uh, steady states of the system. So like with our water, that would be the not boiling and then the full boil, um, excluding the transition point in between where we're reaching the sufficient temperature to cause the water to boil. Um, this is a preferred behavioral state, so it attracts the behavior toward one side or the other. Um, now, importantly, it's also where we are optimally energy efficient. Um, so like a good example of this is walking gate and running gate. Those are both attractors. Um, which one we spontaneously select depends on how fast we're moving. So it's based on the speed of locomotion. If we're walking more slowly, then we naturally have a walking gait. As speed increases, then we will transition spontaneously into a running gait. Um, now, if we try to force ourselves into a walking or a running gait at the wrong speed, that is very energy inefficient. So we naturally will choose the most energy efficient, you know, state of locomotion or type of locomotion based on our speed. Um, so when we're forced to walk faster than we want to, or forced to run slower than we want to, or whatever it might be, um, then we are using more energy to do that. Even if like, let's say we're forced to run more slowly than we naturally want to, um, it takes more energy to run more slowly. It takes more energy per mile to run slower than you'd prefer to. Um, stable regions of operation around which behavior typically occurs when a system is allowed to operate in its preferred manner. Okay, order parameters are also referred to as collective variables. Uh, these are variables that define the overall behavior of a system and define a movement pattern. Um, so they enable a coordinated pattern of movement to be reproduced and distinguished from other patterns. A good example of that in movement control is relative phase that applies to rhythmic movements like gait patterns. Um, so it's a quantified value that represents the movement relationship between two moving segments. Um, so we can quantify the amount of movement that's happening between one segment and another, one joint and another in each, you know, at each time point or during each phase of an action. Um, so relative phase can be in phase. So um, the, the movement can be in the same direction or it can be in the opposite direction and that would be antiphase. Uh, but in either case, they're coordinated. They're coordinated patterns. A control parameter is the variable that when increased or decreased will influence the stability and character of the order parameter. Um, so like, for example, if we are boiling water, you know, back to that pretty basic example, uh, the control parameter in that case would be the temperature. Um, so the order parameter would be basically whether the water is boiling or not, and that's going to be influenced by the temperature of the water, and that would be the control parameter. Um, so in, um, when we're looking at coordination and motor control, it's important to identify the control parameters um, because it's the basis for being able to assess the stability of the pattern of coordination and for shifting a pattern from one stable state to another. So we need to understand what is the variable that is affecting how we choose our coordination pattern and what causes us to make that abrupt change 
you know, from walking gait to running gait or from not boiling to boiling water. Uh, Self-organization is the emergence of a specific stable pattern of behavior due to certain conditions characterizing a situation rather than it to a specific control mechanism that's organizing behavior. Um, so it's when certain conditions characterize a situation, a specific pattern of limb movement emerges. Um, you can also see this in physical science. If we look at hurricanes, like there's no um, organized like motor plan <laughs> for lack of a, a better explanation. There's no uh, like plan for a hurricane, but it's something that self organizes when the conditions are right. So when certain conditions are met of water temperature and wind and, and all of that, um, when those conditions are met, then a hurricane emerges. So that's a specific coordination pattern essentially of the water and air. Um, and so same thing happens in the body. So there are certain conditions that are met or certain conditions that characterize the situation. It generates a specific type of limb movement. Um, the coordinated pattern of movement self-organizes within the framework of the characteristics of environmental conditions, the demands of the task and the limb dynamics. Um, so we see that again in walk to run or run to walk transitions that self-organize based on speed. Coordinative structures are also referred to as muscle synergies or motor synergies. Um, these are functionally specific collections of muscles and joints that are constrained by the nervous system to act cooperatively to produce an action. Um, so basically, our muscles and joints learn to work together to produce a specific action. Um, so we can develop them through practice or experience and some exist naturally. And I'll talk more about the difference on the next slide. Um, muscles and joints used to reach and grasp an object must act together to enable successful reaching and grasping. Um, so someone would start with the intention to reach and pick some, some, some that it would start with the intention to reach and pick something up off of the table. Um, and so they would activate a coordinative structure that would allow them to do that. So it's uh, so the coordination between the muscles and joints that are going to allow you to reach and pick the thing up off the table. Then depending on the characteristics of the limb and the environmental constraints, the coordinative structure self-organizes to carry out the action. Okay, so we have the muscles and joints that are enlisted to participate in this movement. Um, and then maybe you have to reach around something to pick the thing up, or maybe the object is really heavy and you need to get closer to it. So you have a shorter movement. Um, so you have a shorter, oh, the word went right out of my head. Sorry about that. Um, so there's a shorter effort arm. There we go. Um, back to my biomechanics brain, <laughs> got to switch gears there. Um, so yeah, you, so there are different constraints in the environment and about the task and the object. Um, and so even though you have the same muscles and joints that are going to participate in that and, and coordinate that movement, you're still going to have to make edits essentially to be able to carry out the action successfully. Um, so coordinative structures reduce the degrees of freedom that the system must control because instead of having to control separately every little motor unit, every muscle, every little joint, um, instead we're able to control sort of the group or the ensemble of muscles and joints to execute the action. Okay, so coordinative structures uh, can be intrinsic or they could be ones that we develop through time and practice. So intrinsic coordinative structures, uh, so ones that we, we develop naturally as children, uh, involve actions like walking, running, and bimanual coordination. Uh, so they tend to be more symmetrical. Um, so in general, we tend to want to move and do things in a symmetrical way, um, which is like like if you've ever, um, if somebody's ever asked you to rub circles on your stomach and pat your head at the same time, that's why that's hard to do is because we naturally want to move our hands in a symmetrical way. Um, so to move them in an asymmetrical way, we have to kind of learn that, that action and practice it. Um, so when we develop coordinative structures through practice, 
Um, we have new combinations of muscles and joints working together to produce a coordination pattern um, that is different from our intrinsic structures. Uh, so we often have to develop them for asymmetrical coordination. So something like playing drums or a tennis serve where your arms are doing entirely different actions. Um, so in a lot of cases, when, when it's asymmetrical, uh, we have to really work hard and override those intrinsic patterns that are telling us to move in a symmetrical pattern or in a, a coordinated like interlimb pattern. Um, we have to kind of override that to learn the new uh, coordinative structure. Perception action coupling as uh, the spatial and temporal coordination of vision and the hands or feet that enables people to perform eye hand and eye foot coordination skills, which I talked a little bit about this in a past video. Uh, but it's the coordination of the visual perception of the object and the limb movement required to achieve the goal. Uh, we talked about this in a past video. We talked about tau, which is the perceptual variable related to the time to contact between an object and a person's eye. Um, so like if you're driving and you're in danger of hitting the person in front of you or the car in front of you, um, the rate of change of the object on your visual field is giving you an idea of your time to contact. So how much time do you have before you are going to crash? And that we use that feedback to govern our motor control and our, our response, which would be to hit the brakes. And so then how hard do you hit the brakes or do you need to swerve out of the way is going to depend on how much time you perceive that you have. Uh, so it guides actions by coupling perceived time to contact with dynamic movement. So your, your response to what you're perceiving. Um, coordination patterns change to get over an obstacle, climb stairs and navigate other environmental features. So it's not just about time to contact. It's not just how long until you hit something or it hits you, um, but it's also your perception of, um, you know, are these stairs climbable? Is this space large enough for me to fit through? You know, that sort of thing. So your perception of the size of objects, distance from things, um, size of space, your perception of the size of your own body and your proportions and um, whether you think you there's room for you to sit on that, you know, step or whatever it is. All right, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.